We live in toxic times, but we don't have to live in toxic bodies. This presentation will discuss the kinds of toxins we humans have been exposed to, both historically and currently, the way in which the body deals with these toxins, and what we can do to support the detoxification process. Pre-industrial men and women had very little to worry about in terms of toxic exposure. The kinds of toxins they might have encountered were limited to the smoke from a cook fire, the occasional poisonous plants and mushrooms that might find their way into the soup pot, the toxins found in moldy foods, and heavy metals like lead and mercury found in well and river water. The name of the detoxification system that handles these types of poisons is called the glutathione conjugation pathway, and for pre-industrial man, this was all that was needed. Modern men and women have these same types of toxins to deal with, but both the manner in which we are exposed to them, as well as the amounts we are exposed to, have changed. Let's look first at smoke. Our troubles began in the 1800s with the widespread use of coal as an energy source for homes, factories, transportation, and the production of electricity. In London, infamous black fogs from burning coal would last for days, darkening both the faces of the buildings and the lungs of their inhabitants. Many of the citizens of London and other newly industrialized cities became sick and died. In time, legislation was passed putting coal-burning plants farther away from residential sectors, but this was only a short-term solution. There is, after all, only one planetary atmosphere, and as more and more countries became industrialized, the smoke from burning coal became a worldwide problem. Add to the air the exhaust expelled from the now nearly 600 million vehicles on the world's roads, and you can see that the smoke problem has only increased. In some cities like Los Angeles and Mexico City, daily smog reports are given in the newspapers and radio stations, letting people know how safe it is to go outside and breathe the air. Comparing photos of the atmosphere over the last 20 years, meteorologists have been able to document a significant darkening of our skies. A thick cloud of toxic air has settled over the planet, and while it is worse in some areas than others, the atmospheric changes are evident from pole to pole. Add to this the fact that some of us breathe smoke directly into our lungs from cigarettes, and the problem is only compounded. Our glutathione system was sufficient to detoxify the smoke of a small cook fire, but it is overwhelmed by the sheer mass of airborne toxins it must currently deal with, and so these airborne toxins have begun accumulating in our bodies. Let's move on to the next type of toxin, chemicals. The only chemicals pre-industrial man was exposed to would be found in the plants he would eat. Plants have various defenses against being eaten. Some plants, like cactus, develop sharp spines as a deterrent. Others manufacture chemicals that make those who ingest them sick. Cooking would often destroy or dilute these poisons to levels that were no longer harmful. But still, we would need the glutathione system to deal with them from time to time. Today, we are exposed to thousands of chemicals on a daily basis. Each year, an estimated 400 million tons of the 6 to 7 million known chemicals are produced for use in industry. Artificial colors and flavors, preservatives, toxic sugar substitutes, and many other chemicals go directly into our food and drink. The rest of these chemicals eventually find their way into the air, soil and groundwater, and then into our bodies. Again, our glutathione system is overwhelmed and as a result, our bodies accumulate toxic chemicals. The third group of toxins we will discuss are those that come from bacteria and molds. It may seem odd that we are still dealing with bacteria and molds in the 21st century. After all, refrigeration keeps food from spoiling, so where would we find ourselves exposed to them? Let's look at mold toxins first. 
All the grains, nuts, and seeds we eat are routinely tested for mold toxins, and if they test above a certain level, they are removed from the human food supply. Even with this inspection, our food is often infected with mold toxins at some level. Take any nut, grain, or seed and look closely at it. It probably looks fine, but place it under an ultraviolet light in a dark place and you will often see the telltale eerie green glow given off by mold growing on the food you are about to eat. Animals get even less protection. The feed given to cows, poultry, pigs, and fish are allowed to, and regularly have, extremely high levels of mold toxins in them. Food considered too moldy for human consumption is purchased at a discount as feed for these unlucky animals. Over the animal's life, these mold toxins continue to concentrate in their tissues in ever-increasing amounts. When we then eat these toxic animals, their mold toxins are passed on to us. Through the principle of biological magnification, we often end up with mold toxin levels hundreds of times higher than that of the livestock we actually eat, and thousands of times higher than the moldy food they eat. This, added to the fact that these animals are all massively dosed with antibiotics from the day they are born until the day they are slaughtered. These antibiotics, meant to prevent their cramped and unhygienic living conditions from giving them infections, makes for an even greater mold toxin exposure, as many antibiotics are made from molds. When you include the toxic molds growing in the walls and ventilation systems of most houses and office buildings, you can see that we actually have a significantly greater exposure to mold toxins now than we did 300 years ago. Again, our glutathione system is overwhelmed, and as a result, our bodies begin to accumulate mold toxins. Okay, we've discussed molds. Now let's look at bacteria. Better hygiene has removed most of our bacterial exposure with one exception and that is the bacteria we carry within our own bodies. It may be surprising for you to learn that there are more bacterial cells living inside your gut than there are cells in your own body. Billions of bacteria live in our mouths, on our skin, and especially in our gut. Now, if you were breastfed as a child and never given antibiotics, then it is likely that your gut is filled with healthy, life-giving bacteria. These good bacteria help you digest your food and produce useful things like B vitamins and vitamin K. On the other hand, if you have ever taken antibiotics, then you've killed off some of your good bacteria and bad bacteria may be growing in their place. These bad bacteria can secrete toxic waste products, sometimes directly into our bloodstreams, day in and day out. Let's discuss heavy metal exposure. The only source of heavy metals for pre-industrial men and women would have been their drinking water. Unfiltered well and river water could have small amounts of lead, mercury, arsenic, and other metals in it, but rarely in amounts high enough to be of concern in most locations. We, on the other hand, are continually exposed to heavy metals in unprecedented amounts. It is estimated that we will eat one-third of a teaspoon of mercury, one teaspoon of arsenic, one teaspoon of lead, one teaspoon of nickel, and over three pounds of aluminum in our lifetime. There is no way that our glutathione detoxification system can hope to keep up with this level of exposure, let alone deal with all the other types of toxins we have discussed. What we need to do is to find a way to support our overwhelmed glutathione detoxification pathway so it can get these toxins out of our bodies. To support the glutathione detoxification pathway in our bodies, we have to do two things. We have to increase the amount of glutathione in our bodies, and we also have to increase the levels of glutathione S-transferase, the enzyme that the glutathione works with. Let's look at increasing the glutathione first. Glutathione is a tripeptide protein and is made up of the amino acids cysteine, glutamic acid, and glycine. 
It is made in every cell in the body, and in addition to its job in detoxification, it is one of the body's most important antioxidants. Because of its tripeptide structure, oral supplementation of glutathione just doesn't work. When taken orally, glutathione is simply digested into its original amino acid building blocks, just as any other protein would be. This is precisely why the glutathione given in a hospital emergency room for acute poisonings is given intravenously. Glutathione simply can't make it through the digestion process intact. Another method to increase glutathione is to take additional cysteine, glycine, and glutamic acids, but there is no guarantee that they will make glutathione since there are many other uses for these amino acids that compete with glutathione production for their use. Fortunately, there is another option. Glutathione can also be given by suppository. Since there are no digestive enzymes or acids in the colon to break the glutathione down, administered rectally, glutathione enters the body fully intact. Taking intravenous glutathione is invasive, time-consuming, and requires a medical professional to administer. Glutathione suppositories can be easily taken at home by anyone. Okay, that takes care of glutathione. The second thing we need to do is increase glutathione's enzyme cofactor, glutathione S-transferase. It's the glutathione S-transferase that actually attaches the glutathione to the toxins. Without this enzyme, the glutathione simply won't work. So, we know how to increase glutathione. The question that remains is, how can we increase the glutathione S-transferase? The answer, surprisingly, is coffee. Everyone knows of the ability of coffee to keep us awake when we're tired, but it is also a great detoxifier. But here's the catch. It has to be taken as a suppository. Drinking the coffee won't have the same effect. This is because when coffee is taken rectally, it goes right to the liver, where it has an entirely different effect than when you drink it. Orally administered, coffee is a stimulant, but only a mild detoxifier. Rectally administered, coffee is a relaxant and a powerful detoxifier. The first recorded application of rectally administered coffee was in a German army hospital in World War I, where its healing effects were discovered quite by chance. Patients are often given enemas to empty their intestines before surgery, and in one case, a German nurse, unable to find any other warm liquid to use, gave enemas to some soldiers with coffee instead of plain water. The patients who received the improvised coffee enemas reported an immediate decrease in pain. Later, these same patients demonstrated faster recoveries from their wounds and surgeries than their compatriots who received the standard warm water enemas. The coffee enema quickly gained popularity with surgeons and medical clinics around the world as a method of both cleansing the liver and rejuvenating the body. Today, coffee enemas are commonly administered in alternative cancer clinics, both as a means of detoxification as well as a general rejuvenator to the body. While many of the younger doctors have not heard of the benefits of coffee enemas, favoring drugs instead of natural remedies, many of the older doctors swear by them. Fortunately, we don't have to take an enema to get this special benefit of coffee. Similar to glutathione, coffee can also be administered as a suppository. The advantage of using coffee in suppository form is that it is faster and more convenient and does not wash away electrolytes or impose an additional fluid load on the heart and kidneys like an animal will. To this end, we have created Xenoplex suppositories. Xenoplex suppositories contain both glutathione as well as organic coffee extract. The glutathione in Xenoplex is delivered intact right to the body, and the coffee extract helps raise the glutathione S transferase levels at the same time. 
Using these two ingredients together, you can literally supercharge your body's detoxification system. Our body has the ability to detoxify itself, provided we support it properly. Yes, bodies.